Hi everybody, welcome. I'm Melissa Shimento here in Oregon. Super happy to be with you today. So we were created for fellowship with God and it's all about relationship, relationship, relationship. Uh, we see it from the beginning in Genesis with Adam and Eve. We see it with Moses face to face. We see God interacting in the Old Testament with people all the time. And we wanna hear God's voice because it's about relationship, relationship, relationship. We know to know him is eternal life. And Dr. Mark Verkler has helped me um, take a look at some principles found in Habakkuk. He teaches a great course that I am gonna to attempt to, to teach as well. I've taught it at Coffee Creek Correctional Facility, at a prison here in Oregon, and then a few times at my church. So welcome. But today, super simple, we're going to look at Habakkuk and four keys of hearing God's voice. We're going to be able to um, say it in a sentence, and we're going to be able to teach our children. And it's going to be a habit that we're going to develop, I pray, so that we can hear God's voice for very specific things about that child, that incident, this season in your life. Um, and um, so I just am really, really excited to be here. I just want to draw your attention before we look at uh, Habakkuk to Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 21. Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 21. You can take a look at that, but basically because of Jesus, we're welcome to come in and... Um, to come and fellowship with him and come and communicate with him. And that word, boldly come, means with no hesitation. Um, it's bluntly, freely, uh, openly, and with courage. We can come. You can come. I can come now. Bluntly, freely, openly, and with courage because of what Jesus did. So we can come close to God. Um, we can approach him. We can come with an open heart because Jesus made us completely presentable to God. So we're invited to come in faith believing. In fact, I was reading this morning um, in my Bible, I think it's Mark 9, where Peter, James, John on the mountain of transfiguration and um, Elijah and Moses are there and it's Peter who says, this is fantastic. Let's build some tabernacles for you. And he's already launching on this awesome building project. And he's striking me this morning that God the Father uh, breaks the conversation and says, this is my beloved son, hear him. And I think a lot of times I've done the talking. I'm like Peter, hey, let's do this, let's do that. I go from zero to a 160 seconds. And, um, and God would say, hear him, hear Jesus. So this is going to help you hear him. And then from that place of hearing, we're going to walk out our lives. Um, so Habakkuk, chapter one, we see Habakkuk asking all kinds of questions with God. But Habakkuk 2, verses 1 and 2, that's going to be our text. Um, Habakkuk 2, 1 and 2, if you want to turn there. Okay, it says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to his complaint. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may see it and run with it. So Holy Spirit, we invite you to come. You are our teacher. Teach us in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. So Habakkuk is asking questions of God. He's saying, God, why don't you do something? Uh, why do you use wicked men? He's questioning God's methods. And we see after a full chapter of asking his questions of God, Habakkuk stands and stations himself. So asking questions of God really frees me up because I see from his perspective and there's freedom from me when I see from God's perspective. Asking questions of the Lord can bring revelation into my life, into your life, and it can give us new ways of thinking, new insight and understanding, and you know that understanding is a tree of life. And we have a great role model with Jesus. He asked over a hundred questions in the New Testament. Um, he asked, you know, why do you worry? What do you want me to do for you? How many loaves do you have? Do you love me? Do you see anything? Do you want to get well? Why are you so fearful? Who do you say that I am? A hundred questions. And we, we ask because we want to get an answer and we want to seek information. Um, there's lots of scriptures that talk about asking, ask and you will receive. Ask and it will be given to you. You have not because you ask not. So 
questions to ask the Lord. There's a lot of them. But Lord, is there anything in my life that is blocking fellowship with you? Are there unbelieving parts of my heart that you want to address? How can I love this difficult person in my life today? These are some of the questions that I've used over the years. Lord, is there anything you would have me do to increase my skill? Um, who do you want to be for me right now? What are you teaching me? So we turn to the Habakkuk and we see many questions he posed for the Lord. And like Habakkuk, if you have asked a question, you need to do what Habakkuk did. You need to wait for an answer. And so we want to pray, God, apprehend my heart so that I long and hunger for you. Wake me up in stillness. So key number one that we see in Habakkuk is just stillness. Um, I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart. So we want to quiet ourselves down so we can hear God's voice. And this is where stillness is where we stop our activity and we pause to be with the living God. It's about you disconnecting from everything else and connecting with him so that his life can flow out of your life. Um, Lamentations 3 verse 25 reads, The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. So that word wait actually means look for, expect, waiting hopefully. Psalms 130 um, verses 5 and 6, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. So if we're going to commune with God, first we must learn to become still. It sounds simple, but it may be the most resisted activity on the planet. So stillness is where we're going to dial ourselves down. And we're going to look at Mark chapter 1, verse 35, and we're going to see some keys to stillness. Mark 1, 35, in the early morning, when it was still dark, Jesus departed to a lonely place. So um, for me, uh, when I had three babies in three years and they were all in diapers and I had no family support, oh, dark 30 in the middle of the night in a closet that had no door was the place that I met with God. Um, you aren't going to find many people doing what you're doing. It's a lonely place. Um, Jesus departed to a lonely place to pray. Um, just you. And the surprise is that I love to tell everybody is once you get there, which I used to just be excited and pinching myself that I was up so early with a Bible on my lap. There's actually four of you because you will find that the Trinity has been waiting. Yeah, he's been waiting to talk to you. He's been waiting to talk to you. So, um... How do we think about spending time with God? I suggest that we should think less like, ugh, I'm up so early, it's so dark, it's rainy, it's cold, I'm tired. Um, it's not an obligation. I think it needs to be a prayer. Maybe we would want to move towards as more, Lord, may I not miss or neglect or ignore your invitations to come to you and be with you. Keep me alert to the invitations of the Holy Spirit so we can partner together. I want to have a yes in my spirit to his invitations, um, and I want to have really a childlike faith that just says I'm coming. So the truth is, if I come to him, the needs of my soul and my spirit and my body will be fulfilled. Um, if you've lived long enough on the planet, you know that no person can do that. It's a supernatural thing. So we have need of him, and we need to slow down, and we need to take time. So we need to be still before God and give ourselves time to know or even feel your need. Some of us are moving so fast, um, we don't even know what our need is. And then we just respond to the invitation to come so that we can even know the cry of our heart. So if we see coming to the Lord um, as us accepting an invitation to a feast in God's kingdom, we are posturing, I think, ourselves in a truer reality because Jesus made a way for us to have free and fresh access to God. So I would ask you, what is the cry of your heart now? Do you need joy? Do you need acceptance? Do you need grace? Do you need strength, purpose, hope, faith, love? So the goal of stillness is so that our heart can know and sense God moving within. And we know that his promptings are gentle. We hear God out of our stillness. That's why the early morning um, hour is so good. 
before you're awake and busy with all your stuff. And our spirit already knows the things we want our mind to be aware of. We want our spirit to line up with God. In hearing the Holy Spirit, your mind actually begins to understand what your spirit already knows. Um, I love listening to a podcast on um, what Mother Teresa, when interviewed by Peter Jennings, said about, um, you know, what do you talk about when you pray? Peter asked Mother Teresa, and she said, I listen. And he said, what does God say? And she said, he listens. Um, and we know in 1 Kings 19 that God came to Elijah, the prophet, when he stood on the mountain before the Lord, not in the wind, not in the earthquake, not in the fire, but God came um, in the sound of a gentle, still, small voice. So we need to be still. How do we become still? Let's get super practical. My dad was a theologian, uh, graduate school of theology, or Roberts University um, from Edinburgh and Fuller. I've got his diplomas here on the wall, I think. But first, we just want to remove external distractions. And he said, sorry, I didn't finish that about my dad, Dr. Farah. Um, theology should be intensely practical, so I'm all about dialing it down to the intensely practical. So we want to find a place where we can be alone and undisturbed. God won't interrupt your interruptions. He stands at the door and knocks, and it's on us to open the door and let him into our lives. It's easier coming into the presence of things and people, all forms of social media, than the presence of God. Um, this is what I would call an uphill habit. An uphill habit isn't easy, but it's doable. You serve it now, and it will serve you later. So you will be hearing throughout this course, uphill habit. This is uphill habit number one, alone, undisturbed. So you want to be in a comfortable, relaxed position when you pray. Um, you want to find your best time with God and use it. You want to set aside a specific place um, for your personal conversations with God. Where um, So think, I would ask you right now, where could you create a space to interact with God? So the timing isn't just going to happen upon you by accident. Um, even if an hour opened up in your 24-hour day, um, it would be filled with something else, right? So you have to be intentional and feel free. I invite you to set up a daily appointment on your phone. Um, Hear from God popped up on my phone as a standing appointment um, for a long time. Um, and we know it's good time management um, practices dictate that you actually schedule in your values and priorities. So be thinking, what are you going to give up? It will cost you. You will have to say no to lesser things, to say yes to the greater thing. So historically what that means for me is I go to bed earlier than I want to, I miss the ending of movies, I wake up earlier than I want to. So if you would, turn with me to Luke chapter 10, verse 42. Um, we will see that Jesus said about the greatest thing and the one thing that couldn't be taken away was Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. And um, Jesus says in verse 42, there is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. And we know um, that Mary was sitting at his feet. That was a, a season and a time for when he's speaking, we want to be listening to what he would have to say. Like, we, we, don't, <laughs> we don't want God the Father to have it open up the heavens and say, hey, Melissa. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Could you just zip it for a minute and still your heart and hear what Jesus has to say? And Mary did that. And um, it'll never be taken away. You'll never regret the times that you spend with Jesus. Um, another really great thing, because I love rewards, um, he's a rewarder of those who seek him. And you can see that in Hebrews 11:6. But without faith, is it impossible to please him? For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So he is a rewarder. You can expect rewards. So um, so I have a question, an activity for you listening. Um, I would say that there's no shortcuts or substitutes for spending time uh, with God. Um, you need time together. So we can't go deep with God on the run. So I would just ask you, where is your guard post? So a guard post actually literally meant to keep safe from harm 
It protected you and it watched over you. So a guard post, think of it as keeping you safe, protecting you, and watching over you. And when are you going to station yourself on the rampart? Where are you going to surround yourself and fortify yourself? Because a rampart is actually a defensive wall. So ask yourself now, what would you need to do to set yourself up for success? What would you need to do? For instance, our family is in the middle of this little food challenge that I will not burden you with, but we're on day six. Never done it before in my life. It's a new thing. But we had to say, what are we going to do to set yourself up with a success? Well, we removed everything out of the house that wasn't that food product um, just to see how are we going to feel in six weeks if we do that. So that would set me up for success just in the natural, something really practical. But what would set you up for success for your spiritual life? So think about what time and place would be best for you to be still and I want you to write it down in your journal. So you're going to need a journal and a Bible and um, that I'd like you to share it with somebody. So, but on a good morning, I've set myself up for success and I'm leading you to an uphill habit number two. You want to gather all your items the night before. You want to um, get your journal, your Bible, your pen, your blanket, your candle, your tea, whatever you need, reading glasses, and begin with two minutes of silence. So we actually in class practice two minutes, if you're with girlfriends watching this, or guy friends, or whatever friends, your dog, um, put a timer on for two minutes. And just, we're going to learn to quiet your inner being. Until our thoughts are quieted, we most likely will not hear his voice, right? So we want to practice sensing the cry of our heart um, and this is where we're just connected with the current reality of your heart. Um, so if you're in a season where parts of your life are crumbling, the cry of your heart might just be, Lord, arise and make yourself known. <laughs> that might be the cry of your heart. Um, I trust you. Your ways are higher than mine. I hope in you. You will not be disappointed. Let hope rise up. Christ be my hope. So in becoming still, I'm actually not trying to do anything. I simply want to be in touch with God. I am centered on this moment of time. I'm experiencing Him. And being still is an art to be learned. And I want you to have a lot of grace for yourself here. So will you say with me. I'll say it first and we'll say it together. I become still and I'm at peace in the presence of God. God has my attention. I am looking, waiting, and listening to what He would say to me. I become still and I'm at peace in the presence of God. God has my attention. I am looking, waiting, and listening to what he would say to me. That is key number one. Three more to go.